I'm Jane Lowicki Zuka, the Senior Youth Advisor with the USAID Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. I'm happy to be facilitating our session together today. This webinar presents and discusses key findings of a study recently completed by the USAID Feed the Future Advancing Women's Empowerment Program. AWE aims to enhance gender equality and women's empowerment in agriculture programs by providing targeted technical assistance to USAID missions, implementing partners, and the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. The Bureau for Resilience and Food Security <clears throat> commissioned this study to learn more about the prevalence of market systems development programs that target win-win opportunities for youth, women, private sector businesses, and others in agriculture and supporting markets. And more specifically, to better understand the rationales, approaches, tactics, achievements, and pitfalls of this work. Market systems development approaches hold promise for inclusive and sustainable poverty reduction at scale amid scarce resources. Increased evidence has been needed for how markets become more efficient and productive through these approaches with the deliberate inclusion of young people and women. This is especially important given the record number of youth in the world today who urgently need opportunities to constructively participate in their societies. And rural youth will find most opportunities in the near term in agriculture and related sectors. Similarly, without ending the marginalization of women within these markets, the markets will continue to be inefficient and the potential economic and development gains that we know come from women's economic empowerment will be squandered. From my own viewpoint, it's been fascinating to see similarities and differences in the approaches taken depending on the context to learn more about the wide range of types and levels of facilitation used to drive incentives and to think about whether market systems development on its own can achieve or can't achieve more holistic women's empowerment and youth development. Let me now introduce the presenters. This study is one of the first of its kind, and we're privileged to have with us one of its key researchers and a group of four distinguished panelists from two of the 15 inclusive market systems development program activities that are featured in the study. Morgan Mercer is the Director of Gender and Youth Programs with ACDI VOCA. She participated in the research work alongside team lead Natasha Kasanev. The activity was implemented by AWE by Encompass with subcontractor ACDI VOCA. Morgan will present on findings and will moderate a discussion with the four panelists. Two of the panelists or from an activity called RISI Albania, implemented in Albania as led by Helvetas and Partners Albania, with funding from the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. The other two panelists are from an activity called Elan RDC, undertaken in the Democratic Republic of Congo, as led by Adam Smith International, with funding from DFID. So we are very happy to welcome Holly Kruger who is a private sector and market systems specialist working on the Elan RDC project as part of the Canopy Lab. We're also very happy to welcome Clara Garcia Para, who is team leader for RISI Albania's private sector development component working with Helvetas. We also are excited to have Zenebe Uraguchi, who is a development economist serving as regional coordinator for Southeast and Eastern Europe and senior advisor for inclusive systems development with Helvetas. And very happy that Ngama Munduku, who is an agribusiness and value chain expert serving as the advisor and sector lead on the Elan RDC project with Adam Smith International is here with us today as well. Our process today will include Morgan doing a presentation for about 20 minutes. We then have 30 minutes for the panel discussion, and that will be followed by 30 minutes question and answer with you, our listeners from around the world. We encourage you to utilize the chat box to make comments and ask questions throughout the presentation and the panel discussion. 
I and others will be collecting these questions and will pose as many as possible to the speakers during the Q&A. Thank you very much. And Morgan, I turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Jane. Um, as Jane mentioned, my name is Morgan Mercer, and I was one of the researchers for the landscape analysis and case studies that we'll be talking about today. Um, so today, I'll be briefly going over key highlights from the landscape analysis report with you. And given that we have a relatively short amount of time, um, I highly encourage you to take a read of the report after this, as there, is many, as there are many more findings and practical examples of how implementers are working towards stronger inclusion of women and youth in MSD programming. So as Jane talked about, um, this is really important um, work and kind of the first study of its kind. Um, these are the three key learning questions that guided the initial research in the landscape analysis. So first, we wanted to know what opportunities and constraints MSD activities were identifying and responding to. Um, second, what impacts or outcomes were being achieved, so both positive and negative, as well as intended and unintended. Um, and last, how MSD approaches were facilitating win-win market opportunities. So win-win being defined as there were clear benefits to the market actor, as well as to women and or youth. So how did we answer these questions? Um, we started with a list of more than 30 MSD activities um, or activities that were employing robust MSD approaches. These were sourced from expert-led recommendations, program lists from USAID and the Beam Exchange, and from direct consultation with USAID gender, youth, and MSD experts. So in December, we came together with USAID and shortlisted 15 activities for inclusion in the research. And this was based on a set of kind of key selection considerations that you can read more about in the report. But essentially, we wanted a rich sample of activities that had documented learning around women and youth in MSD, and also had rich diversity in terms of geography, sectors, donors, implementers, et cetera. So in the infographic, you'll see some of this diversity represented. In terms of methods, um, for the landscape analysis review, we did this exclusively through document review. So in total, the research team reviewed 324 documents across 15 activities. Um, case studies were then developed, and these were really to zoom in on approaches and practices in more detail. Um, and these were developed using a combination of document review and KIIs, or key informant interviews, with partner staff as well as market actors. So in total, we interviewed 18 individuals across five activities, um, some of whom I'm happy to see are joining us today um, on, the, on the panel presentation and some that I've seen that are joining online as well. We've also developed visualizations that accompany the landscape level findings and specific learning from case studies. Um, well, I, I do want to mention that um, we absolutely feel confident in the findings we're presenting out today and in the report. Um, there are key limitations to the research, um, namely that the landscape analysis was done exclusively through document review. And what we found is that there is a high degree of non-uniformity in data and reporting formats, which can make it very difficult to assess the ways in which specific groups benefited from interventions and or the scale of the approaches being employed. So I will call these out as I talk through the findings, um, but just wanted to, to preface it with that. Um, and again, today I'll be talking about the landscape analysis, but themes from the case studies will be explored in the panel presentation and um, you can read more about them in the, in the materials that are available on market links. So um, what did we learn from the landscape analysis at a high level? Well, first, um, and probably most importantly, we found that there's promising evidence that MSD can create transformative opportunities for women and youth, but that this often takes time and a robust set of tools and tactics to engage market actors in this process. What was also really interesting was the work in non-traditional sectors and roles. So when we say non-traditional, we mean either sectors or roles where women have low levels of engagement or sectors we don't traditionally think of as market-based or necessary to supporting the work of agricultural markets. So for example, while input supply 
and business development services are more traditional supporting markets to agriculture, child care services and labor market information services may be a bit more non-traditional. And what we saw was that work in these non-traditional supporting markets were key opportunities to address women and youth specific constraints in market-based and non-market-based ways. And it often amplified the work in traditional sectors. So while this wasn't done systematically, this is definitely an area to draw out more learning over time around not only how these opportunities are facilitated, but also how impactful they are. Secondly, we found that MSD approaches to engage women are much more advanced than those to engage youth. Um, where a lot of opportunities for youth are facilitated are those benefiting older male youth. Although I do want to note that there were some examples to the contrary, and those are called out in the report. Um, youth developmental stages, particularly as we think about younger youth, is a challenge that hasn't been as well explored in MSD activities. And this is also likely where there is a need to explore hybrid solutions. So looking at kind of a combination of development and MSD approaches to address youth needs that may be outside of the market system. So areas that were called out were things like sexual and reproductive health and basic literacy skills. Third, where there was an active CLA culture or collaborating, learning, and adapting, which I recognize we have folks um, on that aren't from the USA universe. So, um, for those outside of the USAID landscape, adaptive management techniques may resonate more. Um, but we typically saw more progress around inclusion, or at least documentation of it. So while CLA, or adaptive management, is part and parcel of MSD, it is important to call out that it tended to be used to course correct inclusion efforts. And sometimes this was a result of unintended negative impacts that projects were seeing and had to kind of midway course correct. So while this iteration and responsiveness is welcome, um, it shouldn't be a substitute for formative analysis, strategy development, or articulation of a vision for inclusion. We also found that adaptive management is an enabler, but won't move the needle in its own right. It needs to be accompanied by leadership buy-in and staff capacity to move the work forward. Fourth, um, although oftentimes hard to discern exactly what intensity of facilitation was being applied through the review of project documents alone, we did find a spectrum. So those ranging kind of from higher intensity to more light touch facilitation tactics that were employed. Um, some activities saw the need for higher intensity facilitation tactics with distinct target groups like female youth um, or market actors that were a little bit more hesitant to, to engage in more inclusive business models. Um, some activities also saw a need for it, especially at the beginning, and in some cases progressed over time to more light touch support. Um, fifth, it was clear that activities were building on partner engagement tactics to promote inclusion, especially with the private sector. So making the business case surfaced as a critical element of partnership engagement. Yet the many steps involved in building convincing cases that clearly aligned business incentives with development outcomes for women and youth were not well outlined with the exception of a few activities. There were also significant barriers called out to making successful business cases for both women and youth. These ranged from the slow pace of mindset change to the business case not being viable in itself. We've called out some good guidance and tools and then annex to the report, um, especially those developed under the Arab Women's Enterprise Fund and PRISMA, among, among other activities, and that call out specific considerations for building the business case for inclusion. Sixth, a major challenge to this landscape review was the ability to determine how and to what extent women and youth benefited from the intervention at an aggregate level and in comparison with other kind of cohorts like adult men. It was similarly challenging to determine the extent to which the intervention offered the promise of sustainability or scalability. Um, and we saw that there was a need to ensure that sex and age disaggregates are being employed across results to see really how diffuse benefits are across the activity versus whether they're concentrated in specific objectives or components. And lastly, we found that there were some particular elements of activities that tended to have more promising impacts for women and youth. Um, and we kind of coined these around intentionality and um, about gender and youth integration and planning, implementation, staffing, and leadership in MEL. 
So some of these included having a clear vision for inclusion and buy-in from staff and leadership, um, well-informed starting points that were based on assessments and formative research, inclusion of outcomes for youth and or women in results chains, um, development of youth or gender inclusion frameworks and guidelines, and then embracing the learning culture and use of adaptive management techniques to rapidly respond to constraints and opportunities. So now I'm going to dive into a few findings in a bit more detail um, before briefly discussing the recommendation. So one of the findings in the planning or design section is that initially, most activities focus on target sectors where women and or youth currently are found in high concentration and where their roles generally conform to kind of acceptable gender and social norms. Over time, though, we noticed a change with reflection and experience to focus also on non-traditional sectors and roles where women weren't found in large concentration or didn't take on primary roles. So reflection on this pointed to the fact that by only focusing on sectors and roles where women or youth already are, it can reinforce the status quo and further embeds women in their current roles. So as an example, um, the market development facility activity developed this graphic that's on the right of the slide that demonstrates their learning around why focusing beyond women-led and dominated sectors matters for scale. They show that sectors that are predominantly women-led and dominated have great potential for deep impacts, but scale is limited. So by including male-led and jointly-led sectors, they're able to have a range of impact depth while also having potential to reach greater scale. Um, as mentioned before, we also found some cases where activities focused on supporting markets not directly linked to target goods or commodities, but important in indirectly addressing constraints to women and or youth market inclusion. So sectors like child care services. So on the implementation side, um, we saw, as you can likely imagine, a vast array of market systems development tactics being employed to benefit women and youth, both in the ag agricultural market systems and in supporting markets. These have been summarized in the landscape analysis report, including illustrative examples from implementing partners. We also looked at both agricultural markets and, and the markets that support them. So what was interesting, and I talked a little bit about already, was the array of supporting markets where innovations were included to support women's and youth engagement and benefit, including both traditional and non-traditional. Um, so some of the other MSD tactics that we found, um, I've already talked a little bit about engaging partners and making the business case, with many activities explicitly mention, mentioning the importance of identifying the gender or youth leverage and structuring incentives for market actors to participate. Next, specifically in agricultural value chains or sectors, um, more than a quarter of implementing par partners in this um, landscape analysis employed inclusion-related MSD approaches that focused on facilitating inclusive outgrower and ingrower schemes. So this was where women suppliers and producers were supported to expand their roles, production capabilities, and income. In addition, um, we also saw reported efforts to expand access to input supply with a focus on female agent models as a means to increase the number of women as sales agents, distributors, and agricultural advisors and extensionists. They also use these models to expand access to productive resources among women producers. So this included things like agricultural technology and information. There was also evidence of implementing partners using an agro-dealer or agent mo model as an entry point for youth in agriculture, but many of these models failed to take challenges for female youth into consideration. We also found inclusive entrepreneurship support services models. Um, so this included things like BDS or business development, service, business development services across several activities. Um, one note about this is that implementing partners seem to use higher intensity tactics to support these models and that there wasn't a ton of evidence and documentation around the scalability of these models. We also wanted to call out that there is really interesting work being done in the financial sector around opportunities for digital financial services to expand women's access to financial products and services and increase their control over income. 
However, um, market-led approaches to improving youth's access to finance is still somewhat limited. And lastly, about half of the activities that we reviewed um, also reported interventions designed to facilitate changes in the broader enabling environment. Given the significant impact it has on creating and enforcing formal and informal rules and norms that can cross-cut or transact a variety of agricultural and non-agricultural sectors. And where activities prioritize social norms work, um, there were some significant challenges around getting market actors to fully lead these interventions, um, which tended to result in higher intensity involvement from the activity. Um, so this is a teaser of a few, but in no way is exhaustive of all of the um, MSD tactics and ways that they've been employed. Um, so I really do encourage you to take a look at the report for more. So lastly, one of the findings related to MEL, um, or Monitoring, Evaluation, and Learning, was that while in general we did find that there's a significant amount of gender and youth data that is being captured and used to drive learning, um, which is great, but there does tend to be limited standardization of indicators and inconsistencies in reporting that make it very difficult to draw conclusions around MSD impacts on women and youth, both within and across activities. So specifically, the selective sex and age disaggregation in reporting makes it difficult to assess whether inclusion elements are, um, and impacts are fully diffused across the activity or more relegated to a set of discrete partners and interventions. What was really interesting to see, though, was the range of methods that activities are using to better capture and drive learning, even if the results aren't always fully reported on in project documents. So this included things like specialized learning studies done on women or youth targeted interventions, which did provide great opportunities to track positive and negative consequences, improve approaches, and deliver better results for women and youth. Um, although, you know, they may have been limited in what they could say about the broader portfolio of interventions and or how effective they are at scale. And lastly, most of the activities in this study did rely on market actors and partners to collect and report data relevant to activity indicators and results. Um, a few activities also mentioned specifically working with market actor, actors to capture gender and youth data to enable them to make more informed decisions around inclusion. So for example, the Feed the Future ANOVA project worked with input firms to introduce a CRM system that captures sex disaggregated customer data and monitors effectiveness of marketing strategies. Natal and Bai um, also helped to establish database monitoring systems in consolidation networks or producer networks that allowed for each network to track and monitor their own data. And as a result, some of these consolidation networks actually set higher targets for women's participation and benefit. So this is an interesting area for further learning and exploration. So based on some of the findings I've touched on today and many more in the report, we came up with a set of recommendations based on where there are significant gaps um, or areas where there was promising evidence of impact for women and youth in MSD. So these include, um, first, we need to better understand youth in market systems development and limitations of MSD approaches to meet youth development needs. So there appear to be some areas of complementarity between MSD and positive youth development, especially around facilitating access to jobs, self-employment, and finance. But those focused on more holistic youth development needs are still somewhat limited. We've seen that implementers may need to employ higher intensity approaches to fill in these gaps, but there also may be limitations of MSD to fill all youth development needs. Second. While we're able to put together an annex of some tools for planning, measurement, and reporting on women and youth, there is still much additional work needed to document or develop tools to help facilitate inclusion. Furthermore, there's a capacity building element needed to ensure that all staff are comfortable with them and that they're being used throughout the activity. Third, um, again, touching on this capacity building piece, um, but capacity building and staffing for inclusion was a strong theme that came out across the landscape analysis. 
Um, staff recruitment should attempt to identify individuals with the belief system and the personal characteristics that enable women's and youth's inclusion. And responsibility for inclusion should be built into staff performance indicators and plans. Furthermore, the CLA mindset or adaptive management um, should be broadened so that the curiosity it values is also steered towards effective inclusion. This will allow making gender and youth everyone's business a bit easier. And then fourth, um, a healthy balance of early planning and adaptive management driven reflection and improvements is key to inclusion. Adaptive management or CLA pivots however, should not replace formative research, but rather should complement them to drive ongoing iterative inclusion strategies. And lastly, there are clear win-win opportunities and cases to be made, but it often requires looking at both traditional and non-traditional sectors and roles to really be able to amplify the work. Um, and specifically, broader social norms change needs to complement business case tactics to be impactful and catalyze systemic change beyond just individual partnership agreements. Um, this is especially important in sectors where it may be more difficult to facilitate inclusion of women and youth. Um, and selecting lead firms with strong will and skill for inclusion can have significant impacts on changing the attitudes and business behaviors of other firms. Um, so none of this is particularly straightforward, um, and it can look very different in different contexts, as we've seen through this review, um, which necessitates ample time and investigation in developing ideas and then putting them into practice. Um, so that was a very brief overview. Um, thanks for your attention. I'm eager to hand it over to our panelists um, who can talk a bit more concretely about what they're um, seeing and how they're addressing some of these things in their own work. So um, our panelists today, as Jane introduced them, are from two of the activities featured in the case studies that accompany the report. So Rizzi Albania and Elan RDC. Um, Clara and Zenebe are from Helvetas and support the Rizzi Albania activity. And Holly is with Canopy Lab and is technical advisor on Elan RDC. And Nangama is with ASI and works on Elan RDC. And so for those not familiar with these programs, I'm going to just give a, a brief intro to them before we start in on the questions. So Rizzi Albania is a youth employment project supported by the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. And it's implemented by a consortium of Helvetas and Partners Albania. It takes an inclusive systems approach, partnering with private sector actors to encourage innovative solutions that foster job creation and provide more employment opportunities for young women and men in Albania. Rizzi Albania works in tourism, agribusiness, and ICT. And in the agribusiness sector, they focus on medicinal and aromatic plants, or MAPs, fresh fruits and vegetables, and business development services. Now moving to Ilan RDC, um, it is an MSD activity that aims to reduce poverty in the Democratic Republic of Congo by increasing the incomes of more than one million poor smallholder producers, entrepreneurs, and consumers. The activity does this by tackling the root causes of market failures and constraints in partnership with more than 150 private sector actors in finance, energy, transport, and agriculture. Ilan identifies opportunities in agriculture and supporting markets and leverages those opportunities to pr promote greater market inclusion of women at scale while also driving business growth. Elan is now in its second phase with more targeted geographies and sectors and is building on its women's economic empowerment work from phase one. So panelists, um, thank you all for joining us today. And I'll go ahead and dive into the questions. So this one is for Clara from Rizzi Albania. Um, a starting point for many MSD activities is deciding on which sectors they're going to intervene in. Can you explain how Rizzi Albania goes about identifying sectors with strong potential for inclusion? Yeah, hi everyone, and thank you, Morgan. Um, so there are some standard methodologies that MSD programs uh, follow to select um, economic sectors of intervention, or if they would rather, they, they can focus on cross-cutting sectors. Uh, these standard methodologies generally dictate that you would do a long list based on a set of criteria uh, pre-agreed with the donor, 
So for example, uh, one of the questions can be what percentage of the GDP does a particular sector contribute to, uh, or how many uh, young people and women it employs. And based on that, you would have a long list of sectors. Then then uh, you start doing more work to shortlist. Uh, so there's different tools, again, that you can use for that. Uh, at VC Albania, for example, we uh, conducted meta reviews uh, of literature around youth surveys uh, to identify the drivers for immigration, which in Albania is a big problem uh, in terms of uh, youth uh, behavior. Um, and then we complemented that with focus group discussions with young women and men and with potential employers in some of the sectors that we had uh, shortlisted to do the final uh, selection. And some of the questions there that for us were important to understand were, for example, what are the biggest constraints in a given sector for career progression? Uh, what are the perceptions of young people around uh, these sectors? So obviously, this all depends on the context. Um, and to give a concrete example, in Albania, one of the sectors that was long listed as having potential was the construction sector. Uh, but then it didn't turn out to have as much, uh, it wasn't as attractive as the other sectors that we ended up selecting. Um, so yeah, and one last thing I would say is that it's very important for projects that go over uh, several phases as VC has done to incorporate the lessons in terms of sector selection between the phases. So within Albania, for example, in our agribusiness portfolio, uh, in the first phase, we did not have a commodity focus. Uh, and in the second phase, we took some learning from that, and we now have a commodity focus, on, as you mentioned, around medicinal and aromatic plants and fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Yeah, great. Thank you. Do any of the other panelists have anything to add? I can add that, you know, for a long okay, well, Go ahead, Holly. So I can add that for Elon, we followed a similar process during our phase one, going from a long list analysis where the number of women played an important part of the criteria in selection. Now that we're in phase two and that the sectors were pre-identified by the donor, we focused our research in trying to better understand some of the deeper constraints faced by women and men. Um, and accessing uh, market system changes. And so just to point out that just because you start with initial level of analysis and sector selection, the research really never stops. And that's where we are in phase two. Great. Yeah, that's a really important point. Thank you, Holly and Clara. So for um, both for the Albania and, and Elan, um, one of the themes that came out of the research um, was the difference between just increasing participation um, in terms of numbers, but also increasing the quality of that participation. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how you've addressed increasing the number of youth and women participating in market systems activities versus increasing the quality of, of the work in which they're participating? Um, sure. Uh, so I'll, I'll take this one if you want to begin with. Um, we think that quality and quantity are not opposing concepts and, and they must go hand in hand when it comes to uh, development projects. Uh, so in terms of how to make that happen, uh, it starts obviously with sector selection, which is key. Uh, so for example, in VC, we noticed that 60% of uh, people employed in the medicinal and aromatic plant sector were young people. Uh, but most of the jobs that they were performing were precarious uh, and they were unattractive in the mid to long term in terms of career. So in order to, to increase the quality of those jobs, uh, we had to ask ourselves what career progression can look like within an agribusiness sector. Uh, so obviously it's clear when one works in agri that uh, someone does need to grow the crop. So that um, hard work will still be part of the value chain. Uh, but there is a difference between doing that without a contract or doing that um, in terms of wild harvesting in the mountains and doing that uh, cultivating close to home with the security of a contract. So uh, having understood that, we decided that our entry point uh, would be exporters and we would support them to invest in standards and certification 
uh, and support them to bring young people uh, into, into the value chain. Uh, and not only as growers, but also in higher levels. So for example, managing quality management systems, uh, export departments, uh, managing machinery such as drying chambers. Um, so, so yeah, and I believe uh, maybe Genevieve would be also good to see what you think about this. Yeah, I can just add some strategic uh, elements to what Clara has, has shared, um, uh, particularly uh, not only from, from Rizzi, Albania, in Albania, but, but other countries where Helvet Arts has been very active in, in Eastern Europe. Um, I think uh, in, terms of, in terms of enhancing the quality of jobs, but also creating the number of jobs, we need to adapt to the changing dynamics of sectors such as agriculture, uh, be it in, in terms of change in demography, you have the aging uh, rural areas, urban rural migration leading to the so-called feminization of agriculture, the changing nature of, nature of skills demanded in the labor market and, and so on. So to be practical, in, in projects like Rissi Albania, I would like to share three key strategies that Helvetas is using to increase not only just the number of jobs, but also the quality of jobs. First, we are shifting the focus from just agriculture in the conventional sense of production and processing to food systems. By food systems, I mean the governance, uh, economics, and health of food, which also ties in with uh, the concept of green economic development, in which more opportunities exist uh, in terms of creating on-farm employment for, for women uh, uh, and young people. That's the first. Uh, secondly, Helvetas is also integrating agribusiness portfolio with other sectors. What does this mean? It's about increasing the synergies with sectors such as ICT, in which technologies drive smart farming, tourism, in the case of Risi Albania, and, and as well as the, the service sector. For example, our analysis shows that integrating the agriculture sector with, with services provide over 44 million jobs in Europe, including Eastern Europe, with as regular work for 20 million people. So this happens when we try to bring the agricultural sector closer to other sectors such as ICT, tourism, and the service sector. Thirdly, from our experience also, uh, the yes and no debate uh, on whether agriculture is likely to be the main answer to women and youth employment in the future um, is, is not very, very helpful. Um, similarly, the rural-urban debate is also very, very narrow. So our objective in Helvetas, when we work in sectors like agriculture, is to focus on the, the emerging role of, um, uh, of uh, secondary cities that are becoming very important. In countries like Albania, we see a great potential in secondary cities uh, in which agriculture has faced a rapid shift in space, where you have more exchange, more mobilities. So to conclude, ultimately, in order to create more jobs that are also decent, we are looking at, A, the relevance of jobs, for example, in terms of earning potential. B, the, productive, the productivity of having also a job. For example, job subtraction in terms of income, mainly for women also in the form of the ability to, to combine work, family, and personal life. And then C, whether a job offers also prospects to a woman or a young person, such as the skills and, and career growth. So it's, it's very critical to focus on these three aspects of also measuring distant, distant work. And we are uh, using the criteria, for example, from the ILO, with whom Helvetas collaborates to measure uh, the distant work agenda. So let me just stop here. Thank you. Um, Holly or Ngama, do you have anything to add? Sure. I think it's, um, as I mentioned earlier, initially when Elan started, we were very focused on number of women, um, and that formed part of our, our search criteria. 
However, with the encouragement of our donor, DFID, we started to explore different ways to better understand and capture the types of impact beyond just income and enterprise performance. So in 2016, we introduced a framework that looks at potential role change for women. This framework is featured in one of the AWE case studies. And the framework identifies six potential role changes, and these map to the traditional women's economic empowerment domains of access and agency. So we found that using kind of this framework, it helped the team to understand and better uh, have better relevance for the ways in which their work had the potential to benefit women in significant ways. This role change framework has been effective for Elan and I believe has relevance for other MSD programs because it can be easily adapted for and be relevant in different sectors. It makes, in my opinion, women's economic empowerment concepts more accessible to staff and business partners. And lastly, it's consistent with and reinforces our other program tools. Just to give an example of the ways in which it can be adapted, you know, as, as was mentioned, Elan works in a wide range of sectors from agriculture to finance to renewable energy. And the role change framework allows the sector staff to identify roles that are relevant for them without having a, without a, makes it easier to identify these role changes. For example, one type of role change is accessing a new position. In our coffee work, this may mean a woman becoming a uh, manager in a cooperative or serving on a cooperative board. But a new position in our digital financial services interventions could be becoming a brand ambassador or sales agent. So it allows for that flexibility. There's also that accessibility. Staff are able to translate what a role change means relative to their work. And as I mentioned, it's relevant and fits with our other MSD core tools, such as the intervention guide and the results framework. And since 2016, we have been rolling it out across our program, and now our entire portfolio uses the results change, and use, excuse me, uses the uh, role change framework. Great, thank you. And yes, as Holly plugged, the, uh, there is a case study on Elon RDC that goes into more detail about the role change framework if you want to learn more. Um, OK, so thank you, participants. Um, I'd like to hear from Ngama, um, you know, as your, your role in kind of engaging with market actors, as partners in, in increasing youth and women's participation and benefits, um, this is an important part of inclusive market systems development. However, as we've noted in the study, this isn't always easy to facilitate, um, especially with the private sector. So can you talk about some of the ways that you've incentivized or encouraged partners to focus on inclusion? Um, including maybe making the business case. Sorry. Thanks very much, uh, Morgan. Indeed, we have been involved in uh, in uh, approaching or, or facilitating the work with uh, um, private sector actors within the agricultural value chain. But I think it's uh, also important here to mention that uh, traditionally uh, businesses in the DRC, especially in the agricultural value chain, are uh, uh, generally under male leadership. And uh, as such, it, uh, one of the priorities or the areas where we find that there's greater potential for us to introduce the notion or the, the concept of having uh, women promoted or uh, 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 creating more visibility on, on the roles that they are playing. So um, generally what, what happens is that uh, we get uh, signals and even people have this perception uh, that stereotypes women and uh, puts their work as invisible. They, they are considered as invisible contributors to a certain extent. Yet we have more than 55% of, of, uh, of the farming sector made up of uh, those women. So um, we understand that for us to, to bring changes and uh, better performance or better inclusion of, of, of women into uh, private sectors, we have to engage with uh, 
business owners or decision makers. And in that way, uh, a long approach has been to, to bring the subject into conversations with uh, decision mail, uh, makers who are partners, partnering with us. And uh, by doing so, we explore opportunities um, that will help to overcome social and economic barriers that are faced by women. So in the process, uh, we go through advocating role change and uh, promoting an increase in positioning women in uh, what I would call primary roles. Uh, how do we do that? We move from our side when we're designing interventions, we move from the intuitive ways of, uh, of, of uh, designing to directly or straightly uh, promoting role change in interventions in a deliberate manner, meaning that we will go through the whole process and see where and how best we can uh, promote uh, women into uh, better positions or into primary roles. Of key importance to us, uh, it has been actually our agri-business background that has helped us a lot um, because we can uh, speak the language at the same time as we can show to the um, to our partners the importance of having women and how they have performed. Some of us have got a background in in in, in uh, agricultural production or even uh, processing. So we will use our past experiences and some are into. Um, financial institutions background. So we will use that information to show past experiences how women played a crucial role into achieving uh, better results. So um, with that, we have uh, presented women as game changers and we have also achieved some of the results whereby within the value chain we've got uh, women who are now owning businesses in uh, in the sector of feed business, for instance. Uh, we have uh, female trainers and mentors, and uh, we are also talking of uh, female agro-dealers um, and more field agents that are, that are getting involved. So, uh, in a nutshell, that, that's how we have done it. The biggest thing has been to encourage rather than incentivize. Uh, we have encouraged them and the incentives that come as a bonus, but otherwise it's the language that we have uh, spoken to them that they understand that has led us into uh, achieving the results that we have. Thank you. Great, thank you, Ngama. Um, yeah, we definitely heard the, you know, the speaking the language and the same terminology um, as the, you know, the private sector and that treating it as this longer term process of influencing and engaging with um, market actors over time to facilitate the changes that you want to see. So that's great. Um, Clara or Zenebe, do you have anything to add from Mercy Albania? Yeah, along the, that same line. Um, I would say that uh, what one key success factor for us that we see has been to have uh, a project team that can talk to businesses at the same level. Uh, it's very important to uh, staff the teams with the with people who have the right skills. So, uh, however, projects call them intervention managers or project officers. At the end, whoever it is that will talk to the businesses and to the private sector should not come across as a donor employee in an MSD program, at least in our experience. So. We have invested a lot in training the teams uh, to use the language that builds uh, partners' trust. Uh, so, for example, we talk about investments. We don't talk about grants. We try to talk their language. And once businesses uh, have trust in our teams, we discuss with them their long-term vision. Um, so, for example, taking again the example of the medicinal and aromatic plants, uh, rural depopulation in Albania is uh, an issue that will mean that within five to ten years' time, uh, there will be very limited workforce to continue operating as uh, businesses are. So we're partnering with exporters and making to them the business case 
that it makes sense for them to invest in young people, in training them, in having contracts with them, because otherwise they will simply go out of business in not such a long time. Uh, and that is only achievable if the staff has the right skills uh, to engage with the private sector. Yeah, maybe I can I can jump in and, and compliment uh, what uh, Clara said. Uh, from our experience, it's also important that uh, we, we we go beyond defining incentives in terms of financial gains by by private companies, as many of you know, a market system is, is complex uh, that also includes players in, in the support function such as capacity building and, and coordination as well as rules and regulations. This is also true um, in the agricultural sector. For an agricultural system to function well, services such as information flow, coordination and adaptation are, are very important. So, so we engage and work with a whole range of actors in, in the whole ecosystem around the agricultural sector. So my point here is the different stakeholders and actors around the, the ecosystem uh, have different incentives that, that go beyond financial motives. For example, fear, empathy to support the poor, power, and, and, and so on. So equipping um, our staff you know, to have the ability to, to unpack and understand incentives when they work with private companies will be very, very important. Great, thank you. Um, and I <laughs> continue to plug it, but um, in two case studies, um, one focused on Mersey, Albania, and the other one focused on Prisma, um, we dig a bit deeper into partner engagement tactics and making the business case and how those two projects have been thinking about it and operationalizing it in some of their work. So um, again, another plug for the report and case studies. Um, well, thank you, panelists. So I want to turn to, um, you know, I remember in interviews with Holly from Elon RDC, um, the, the topic of staff capacity um, came up over and over. So I want to ask you, why is it so important to build internal staff capacity and ownership for inclusion interventions in MSD? And can you talk a little bit about some of the ways that you do this? Sure. Yeah, as you know, this is a subject that's very near and dear to my heart. Because I believe if the team doesn't buy into it, they're not going to be able to convincingly make a case to a business partner. And there really ends there. Jesse really has to be everyone's responsibility and not just the responsibility of the Jesse advisor, gender quality and social inclusion advisor. On Elan, we're taking a multi-prong approach to building understanding and conviction of its importance. This approach is one that draws from a McKinsey model of facilitating organizational change because unfortunately for many MSD programs, we really are still talking about a paradigm shift to be able to effectively mainstream women's economic empowerment, or gender equality and social inclusion. So on Elan, we do three things. We started with demystifying what gender equality and social inclusion means. We try to come at Jesse from novel angles, and we try to provide explicit support to the senior leader through coaching. So when I talk about demystifying, we do every six months a stock take exercise where we look at the degree to which, or we assess the degree to which the ex an intervention is mainstreaming gender equality and social inclusion considerations. And Gama can, can attest, to, attest to this exercise. It's both an assessment, but also a capacity building and coaching opportunity. Because as you're sitting next to, or virtually sitting next to an intervention lead, you're discussing not only you know, how the intervention has been designed and what they're seeing, but also how they can improve and make it to the next um, you know, to achieve a higher score or a better or better mainstreaming of, uh, of, Jesse, of, of Jesse consideration. Um, in addition to the stock take exercise, we also get feedback through a survey every six months from the staff. So I can get a sense of, you know, how well am I being responsive to what their needs are, whether it's around motivation or training or, or better systems. You know, so we do do capacity building, but we also try to come at it from novel angles. Last quarter, we did a training on uh, universal design, and we're planning on doing another one on market segmentation. 
the, both those technical areas are really about inclusion. But when you're approaching it, you know, with more of a technical language, I start I've started to see better response from team members because I do get a sense that you know there is some fatigue when you talk about we mainstreaming or Jesse mainstreaming and talking coming at inclusion from other technical perspectives has resonated well with team members. The last thing I'll point out is just the real importance of bringing senior leaders along. I'm doing a monthly coaching session with senior leaders in the Elan program where we're not only building their skill set in gender equality and social inclusion, but it's also very much around helping them continue to step into a place of Jesse leadership. Um, because as I said in the beginning, you know, Jesse is really everyone's responsibility, but that tone has to be set from the top. Great. Thank you, Holly. Um, and I'm sure if you need additional resources on this, Holly would be happy to share stuff that she's developed or come across. Um, some of this is also mentioned in the report as well. Um, so one area that we haven't talked a ton about um, already, and um, I'll be honest, there wasn't a ton about it um, from the, the landscape analysis, although we did dig a bit more into it um, in the case studies but is this idea around unintended consequences of MSD on women and youth. Um, where it was, where it did surface, um, so things like increasing women's time poverty or gender-based violence, where it did surface, um, it was usually from specialized learning um, studies or from ongoing monitoring, um, but there was less in documentation around how it was addressed. So I think this is an important question to ask. Um, to both, to both teams, but how do you identify these unintended consequences, and how do you incorporate those lessons into project implementation? Okay, Morgan, I received a message from Jane asking if you can please speak about how we define market systems development and CLA. And if you can please speak about how we approach youth and women similarly or differently. So Morgan, if you can speak to that, that would be great. Sure. Um, so uh, these are, you know, concepts that over the last, you know, 10 years, um, USAID as well as kind of other donors have been attempting to define, um, but essentially, um, there are different facets of a, of a market system, um, one of which is, is inclusion, um, the other two are competitiveness and resilience. So it's, it's basically the why and how um, of making markets work um, better for women and men um, by growing income, services, and livelihoods. Um, and CLA is collaborating, learning, and adapting, and um, it's a, a USAID um, term um, that focuses on kind of the, the core pieces um, of reflection and learning that drive kind of better better practice. And so we can certainly send out um, some links to USAID resources that, that better define them than I can. Um, but I think in the non-USAID world, adaptive management um, is something. And um, Charlene, what was the second half of the question? Um, how are or how we approach youth and women similarly or differently? Yeah, so in the context of, and I think every program looks at this a little bit differently, but in the context of the landscape analysis, um, programs um, define youth um, based on a variety of kind of age factors, uh, which could be country specific um, or um, standard kind of USAID or other donor definitions. So USAID's definition is from 10 to 29, um, but obviously different sets of interventions and tactics depending on kind of the developmental needs of those of those young people. Um, so for example, 10 to 14 year olds would likely have different interventions targeted, different needs, um, opportunities than say um, a 27 year old. Um, within youth, um, there was distinction between male and female youth in the in the programs that we looked at. So definitely, you know, that intersection of gender and um, and age. Um, and then when we were talking about women, um, these were primarily adult women. Some projects were employing kind of more robust uh, 
gender and social assistance dynamics. So some were looking at disability status and the intersection of kind of women and disability or kind of other social identity groups like ethnicity. Um, so it, it really just came down to how projects were defining them and how they were kind of integrating that thinking into how they were analyzing constraints and opportunities for different groups and how they were building out kind of responsive strategies and interventions for them. Great. Thank you, Morgan. It looks like the chat is loaded again and messages are coming in, but we have another question that Jane wanted me to ask you. Can you clarify what do you mean by higher and lower facilitation? Yeah, sorry. I probably should have included a definition of facilitation. Um, so in market systems, um, market facilitation is basically getting market actors um, to facilitate the changes in the market system. So um, light touch um, or kind of lighter intensity approaches would be where, you know, the project is really taking a step back and either through a variety of incentives or influence on the market actor, it's really the market actor that's taking up that um, with very little support from or incentives from the project. Higher intensity, and there's a spectrum, um, but higher intensity where is where the activity or the implementing partner needs to, um, you know, engage a little bit more directly with that market actor to help facilitate or, um, you know, catalyze that that change with the idea that, you know, potentially over time it might it might move to kind of more light touch support. I hope that answers it. Yes, thank you. We have another question that um, came in. Could you please say more about how market systems development programs are and aren't achieving youth development? Sure. Um, so this um, is discussed in the report. I do want to preface this with, um, so in the sample of 15 activities, um, only four were youth-focused programs, and so we have a relatively small sample um, to draw out learning. There is a case study specifically on this topic around, um, you know, efficacy of MSD tactics to achieve kind of youth developmental um, outcomes, and so we looked at um, two programs in Uganda, the Dynamic and the, the, wild, the USAID Wildlife Program. So I would definitely encourage people to take a look, but basically um, there are youth development components that are considered, or at least in the reporting, that were considered out of scope by some MSD programs, um, and this most significantly was basic education. But there are likely development components that are considered within the realm but are not adequately being measured. So this is things where youth are demonstrating leadership, um, income generation, um, skills, depending on the skill type, um, career mobility, um, but and, and the resultant kind of pieces of that, which is maybe increases in empowerment and agency, but these aren't necessarily being measured or weren't, weren't in kind of the documentation that we saw. Um, and there's likely some complexity involved in this, um, but so it's still a little bit premature to say what exactly can MSD deliver and what can't, and I would definitely they refer to that case study because there's a lot of nuance um, and information in there and we need to kind of build um, the evidence base around kind of what MSD programs can deliver for young people. So I hope that, <laughs> I'd also be curious if the panelists, um, if, from their own programming experience, no. um, might want to chime in what they've seen in their own programs. If we I am that. not. I am not certain if they can hear or type. It looks like they're trying to type. So let me try to pick out a Hi, couple everyone. of other Jamie questions from the All Project here. I um, just want to jump in and apologize for the technical difficulties. If you can hear me, hopefully you can. Um, I'm sure that um, the folks at AgriLinks and MarketLinks are working hard to get the connection back. Um, so if you're able to hang out and um, and wait, we'd love to get to some of the other questions <laughs> that, you asked, uh, that you asked in the chat box. Thank you for those. Um, otherwise, yes, 
um, we'll be sending out the recording um, transcript and the link to the report and all the other resources as well after the webinar. So um, again, apologies. If you're able to wait, that would be great. Otherwise, um, we'll have all these things available for you um, afterwards. So, And thank you all for attending again.